Hello and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Economic Forum. My name is Tawanda Gudlanga. This week we are focusing on engineering and its impact to economic growth. The world was found flat-footed following COVID-19 pandemic and in Zimbabwe, given the fact that uh, we are pursuing Vision 2030, we should see Zimbabwe earn an upper middle income status. We will be able to make that vision come through, particularly in the context of engineering. Our guest this week is engineer Martin Manoa. He is the acting chair of Zisco Steel and also the current chair of capacity building of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, WFEO, as well as the current president of the Federation of Africa Engineering Organizations. So thank you so much for coming to the program. Thank you, Tawanda. Good evening, viewers. The world of engineering could not be any more exciting. Um, than this particular time where the world was caught flat-footed by COVID-19. Most importantly, Africa um, has been on a drive to uh, bring about infrastructure development and, and, and so forth. But all that is embedded in engineering. Maybe as a departure point, what is the state of engineering in Zimbabwe and Africa? As you rightly say, engineering is the anchor of all solutions to infrastructure development, uh, either be it physical infrastructure or social infrastructure. So there is no development without engineering. Engineering by nature is the offering of solutions to the messy problems that Africa, the world, especially Africa, faces. You, you have mentioned COVID-19. One of the panaceas and one of the biggest solutions that Africa is relying on now is the engineering infrastructure that will prevent this citizen from diseases, particularly in COVID. Uh, in fact, engineering is the answer to the vision 2030 that Zimbabwe is pursuing. Uh, engineering offers solutions through the use of science, mathematics, uh, and, 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 and sustainability, environmental thinking, and design thinking. Uh, and mathematics is basically the language of engineering. So engineers model uh, the solutions of problems that people are facing. In that regard, so can you say the lack of development in Africa or in Zimbabwe is because of a lack of sound engineering? Partly, partly without engineering, like I said, the development is a non-starter. So, so the problems that we face is, 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 is a myriad of uh, uh, issues. One is uh, obviously low numbers of engineers that we have. And also to a certain extent, depending on the complexity of the infrastructure required, it's also the, the, the lack of respect to engineering. So this is why wherever we get the opportunity, we always say governments in Africa should patronize local engineers because some of the solutions that are offered to Africa are basically imposed, imported from elsewhere, and they are not the best fit. So respecting our own engineers and engineering by engaging them and ensuring that their projects are funded would be a very big way to the development for, of Africa. You're saying that governments need to engage uh, engineers, but engineers by design are meant to solve the problems. Why aren't you forthcoming and coming up with solutions? Uh, absolutely. There are solutions that can be, you know, that can come from engineering, uh, 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 the engineering profession themselves, but what engineering should be is a, a policy framework where the engineering is guided in coming all the way from a preschool, looking at the girl child, looking at the problems and contextualizing them, making relevant policies in parliament. So if the policies are not in tandem with what skills we have, skill set, and if there are no uh, support nets and developmental programs, you know, capacity building programs, to ensure that the engineer is responsive to the environment, we will miss the, the bot. So basically the, the answer is uh, engineering needs support in terms of financing. It also needs to talk to the needs, needs analysis of the people, the common person, which the engineer should know what solutions they are solving. It's interesting that you talk about the role of engineers and being part and parcel of uh, the solution. 
uh, making process. But you also point out on uh, the policy framework itself. Let's, let's look at Zimbabwe. How solid um, are we in terms of policy? The, the Zimbabwean policy framework is, is, uh, um, is, is, is something that we really need to, to look at. Uh, there hasn't been much consistency in terms of uh, building the capacity for the built environment. The built environment is not only engineering per se, because it's, it's, a, it's an ecosystem of architects, quantity surveyors, the engineers themselves, the contractors, and the financing system. So we need a very robust policies that looks at these indigenous school skill sets, the local engineers that, that we have that excel outside the country. And once they are here, then the performance then is look at what we're discussing here, no, not so good. So, so it's, it's because of the efficacies of those policies. Mm -hmm. And understandably so, the policies uh, uh, field is infested with other professions. You know, you know the accountants, it's an over, over, over flood. Uh, the, the lawyers, I shall not speak, uh, they, are, they are all linked to the uh, policy framework. But I would, uh, uh, from an engineering perspective and from the professional view, also look at a scenario where we have a balance in policy making of these professionals, uh, which is one thing that the, the, the Second Republic is, is trying very hard to ensure that there are engineers appointed to policy engineers appointed to work with the other professions in, in, in crafting policies that will address the current uh, uh, problems. But what would you attribute to uh, the low uptake of engineering students, given the fact that you're saying the numbers are still low compared to China, which churns out not less than one million quality engineers a year? Absolutely, you, 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 are, you, are, you are right. You, UNESCO, in a study in 2010, realized that it's the numbers and the needs that affect the development. China, you are right, 1.2 1, 1, 1 million a year of capable engineers. Germany, you know, they have large numbers. And even the stats are like 1 to 6,000 citizens in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, Zimbabwe included. So it's the index, the number of engineers you find in any economy is the indicator of the, it's in fact a better indicator than the GDP. The number of cranes that you see as you land at the airport into a town is an economic indicator because engineering and production are twins. Let's talk about cranes and their non-visibility in Zimbabwe. Join us in the second segment as we focus on engineering. Welcome back. This is uh, Economic Forum. We are focusing on engineering, which is said to be a cornerstone of economic development. Will Zimbabwe uh, realize uh, much benefit uh, from engineering uh, in the context of Vision 2030? And we have engineer Martin Manoa. Before you went to the break, you spoke about indicators, the numbers um, that uh, you, 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 you use, which are a, a better tool than uh, comparing uh, than the GDP. And you also then spoke about the actual visible indicator, which are the cranes. It's been a while that we've seen cranes in Zimbabwe. Um, right now at the international airport, yes, we do see them. They were some at the new parliament building, but is it really uh, in tandem with the efforts and the aspiration of Vision 2030 when we really look at um, infrastructure development and economic uh, development? Clearly, the number of cranes that we see are very little, and that's depressing. And even when you go near the crane, you will not see a black engineer there. You will see some other uh, foreign engineer under those cranes and operating those cranes. So this basically brings the whole issue of how important those cranes are, because once they are engineering economic activities, it means the whole downstream activity in the industry is, is kicking. Everybody, the economy ticks just like that. So what we really need to do is to go back to the drawing board, 
look at our policies. Like why we have so few engineers is because there is a myth that it is difficult, which is not true. Uh, there is the teaching of mathematics. Mathematics is the language of engineering. That again needs to be looked at. We need to have teachers that can properly teach maths and encourage especially the girl child to take mathematics, STEM subjects, you know, mathematics, uh, is physics, chemistry, and other, uh, you know, uh, allied subjects. That's not happening. So we should go to preschool and have a design mindset so that we have a critical mass of engineers that will then take up. Now that we tried and we have that critical mass, the next step is to patronize them, give them work. As government, especially the Minister of Public Works, they should have their first port of call for engineering. The Engineering Council for the list of competent, quality, registered, tried and tested engineers. That will not disappoint them. And these engineers are also regulated. And once they are regulated and given these jobs professionally, then they should be able to deliver better than anybody else anywhere in the world. But I don't understand something, uh, uh, Engineer Mano. Um, you look at Zimbabwean professionals, engineers for that matter, winning awards, representing uh, uh, multinational companies and other conglomerates and even companies in different countries outside uh, Zimbabwe. Why is that? That's quite, it's been cracking our head, but it, it, it's simple, put simple. It's, it's, it's the environment. We need to create a conducive environment that will patronize these people, will encourage them, give them work, and also make them compete to the best of the standard. Because all these engineers, you are right, they've been trained mainly at the University of Zimbabwe, which was our first university. You have people like James Manyeka, he's, he's probably top of the range, running McKinsey. You have the youngsters in the UK. We have one of our young girls that beat 7,000 other contestants in engineering. And now she's running with the MEC team, with the Mercedes uh, Formula One team. You know, the fittings and doing the lubrication, a very complicated, you know, engineering science. We have those are Zimbabweans celebrated. We have young Zimbabweans that have invented driverless cars. Yeah? That, that Tesla and Google and everybody else want to snap as a startup. So, so they, they've been from the same schools. So what, what is the difference? To me, is the environment. It's the context. It's the policy framework. It's also the support. It's the perception by the public. Why are we not happy to employ our own sons and daughters and put them to the test? Look at Great Zimbabwe. Who built Great Zimbabwe? Our forefathers. And, and you, it cannot be matched anywhere else in the, in, in, in the world. Somewhere along the lines, all those skills were killed deliberately. Maybe in colonial era, where we needed to promote the other type of the engineer because of race relations that we had. But after independence, there's no excuse. There's no excuse not to promote our own and but, ensure that they, they deliver. But to put the local engineer to the test, um, government had actually given contracts. Uh, as you are aware, the uh, Bide Bridge uh, Chirundu Highway and it has given to different uh, players believed to be local or was said to be to be local. Can you say they're up to the game? Wow, the, you know we could have finished that road yet the mindset and the policy framework been right. What has been done in the Bike Bridge Harare is yeah. a very typical example. Even His Excellency visited it and it's a road you can see anywhere else in a first world country, anywhere else. And these are Zimbabwean contractors. What was different? The difference is this time they've been supported. They're also getting paid. There was a time when engineering professionals would do jobs for, for, for municipalities, for local government, for government, and not get paid, and they, got, they went bust. And therefore, all their good people left for South Africa. This is why they are now doing so well in South Africa, in, in Botswana, in the, in the UK. These people left because the opportunities were not there. Talking about uh, opportunities, what are the low-hanging fruits? when we talk about engineering, particularly in Zimbabwe? The most biggest low-hanging fruit is the advent of the industrial 4.0 revolution. With our young population, with a research mindset in our universities, the lowest hanging fruit is now design is cheaper because we can now use uh, uh, things like construction 4.0 where the cost of designing, supervising, and, and maintaining or repurposing 
buildings has become lower. And we have a young educated population of young engineers that can take up to this. So that's a low hang. The other low hanging fruit is also uh, uh, the, the capacity that we need to give the, to our contractors. Like if we give them the five M's, capital, machinery, the manpower, properly trained manpower and everything, and then also give them the, the movement and the traction and the jobs. So those are low hang. Eh? We are well trained as Zimbabweans. Uh, in fact, you go in any country, I've overemphasized that. They will tell you if you are Zimbabwean, the interview is a waste of time, we will just hire you. But the same trust does not exist here. So we need to improve on our love of our professionals and trust, and also maybe ensure that government gives more than 40%. You know, 40% of all the projects that are coming, we have the Batoka coming, we, we also have the revival of Zisco Steel to locals. We also have the agriculture, engineering. 90-70% of agriculture nowadays is mechanized, and that's engineering. Drones will do your weeding, they will do your, your insects and pests control, they will do your soil analysis, they will do your field analysis. All those things are low-hanging things that we need to integrate into our development policy. Join us in the third and final segment as we seek to find out how best we can trust our engineers going forward. Join us then. Welcome back. This is the third and final segment where I am speaking to engineer Martin Manoa, who is the chair capacity building of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. He's also the president of the Federation of Africa Engineering Organizations, as well as acting chair of Zisco Steel. Coming to Zisco Steel and other uh, 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 companies within that value chain. Zisco Steel was a key, key uh, company to uh, the um, economic drive in Zimbabwe. And it seems that there are too many false starts and stops. What exactly is going on? Yeah, uh, the history is not too good. Like you said, the now cabinet and the government of Zimbabwe is resolved to, 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 to look forward and resuscitate uh, Zisco Steel, revive it. Not only Zisco Steel, but the war still uh, making uh, and still an iron value chain. So the, to, this, to this extent, we at Zisco are very serious, working with uh, with, with cabinet, uh, working with the industry players. We have come up together to craft a robust strategy that will come up with a, a very, very purposeful prospectus of what is Zisco still, an assay of what materials we have, a feasibility, a bankable feasibility study of what can be done. And then once that is done, then there should be an investors conference where we honestly talk to serious investors. Uh, previously, there has been quite a lot of mistakes and we have learned very hard, uh, the hard way uh, and we are not going to repeat those mistakes. What we are going to do is to have a, an investor conference uh, working with ZIDA, uh, working with government, our ministry, that of industry and commerce, very hard to identify serious partners. But most of all, they are low-hanging fruits that the Kwekwe community, the Redcliffe community, the Rutendo community can, can, can be smiling about. We also have a, a diaspora skills, and our board recently resolved to engage all those people uh, that are in the diaspora that are still around Cisco so that we can come up with a master plan and a strategy for the revival of Cisco. This then means we're also going to ride on the technology, like you, you rightly said. The, 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 the industry for technology, you know, we're going to create a, a, that environment for innovation research and, 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 and we'll build that capacity together with our universities. Zisco is going to have a research mandate with the, the University of Zimbabwe, the Midland State, which is the resident university, Kwekwe Polytechnic, as well as Chinoy University and HIT come up with the research framework and, 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 and we apply our minds as Zimbabweans. But how do you apply your minds when innovation hubs themselves are said to have been set up but there seems to be some slow traction to it? We, we're going to work very hard with the uh, uh, Minister of, of, of Higher and Tertiary Education and Innovation and Science Development. Uh, that to me is our promise. 
the innovation hub and the industrial parks are going to form part of our think the mindset then it means we are going to engage these people formally in a research mandate with the research contracts with the deliverables and outcomes that we expect at Zisco. So what, what we really are saying is we must stop the talk and start the walk. And this walking is not easy. It's not a, there's no park at Zisco. You know it. You, we will probably invite your team to go and see for yourself uh, what is Zisco. It's a rich uh, a, 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 a array of assets that Zimbabwe has. The mineral wealth, you know, that capacity and the whole value chain of the steel making process is all embodied at it, it Zisco Steel. But the issue of uh, capacity then comes into the question. Whilst you may have a, a lucrative prospectors, as it were, and an investor conf uh, conference, are you going to get the right type, uh, type of investor who's really going to uh, see to it that uh, 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 Zisco goes up and running again? I, I, I will not mince my word. We are getting 100% support from the office of the president and cabinet, from cabinet itself. Our minister is passionate about it, from ZIDA. And there is an interministerial team set to look into the issue of Zisco. This is how serious our government now is. You know, Zisco is a nexus of power, of ZESA. Of, of Wangi Koreari, of NRZ, of the community around Kwekwe. So it's the whole industry of Zimbabwe. This is how serious we must be. And when we say reviving Zisco, it's not only Zisco. It's every citizen of Zimbabwe must come up with ideas and we are open. We are very open uh, uh, Zisco uh, and our mandate as such is to ensure that at least something has to start in the near, near future for, for Zisco. But engineer, with the same sort of zeal and energy, why aren't you also coming up with robust strategies that actually retain and even bring back our engineers? I, I am very glad maybe in another capacity. I, I think people used to work in silos. The built environment is now working together. Even I will tell you now we are trying to attract our young, trying to do a database, doing the engineering council in the Zimbabwe institution of engineers building capacity and also working. This is why they have deployed me to work with the Static Federation, Africa Federation and the World Federation. The whole aim is then to do a, a, a roll call for our diaspora to try and woo them back. Some of them don't, don't need to come back to Zimbabwe. There is what we call brain circulation. With technology, this can work from all over. Uh, there is a COVID-19 initiative, I may want to say, uh, 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 with the built environment went into. We've managed to catch those youngsters and all those engineers that left Zimbabwe. They are all going to give their services in the design together with the professionals that are inherent in Zimbabwe, pro bono, for a COVID-19 isolation center. And this is one example that brings people together and then that attracts them back home. Whatever we do, home is best. So, so the, all these youngsters need opportunity, but they cannot leave lucrative contra contracts to come and do nothing here, to come and sell airtime. No, we need to create the right professional opportunities for them. It's interesting that you talk about that, yet we do have bodies uh, that actually uh, lobby for uh, engineers' interests. The Zimbabwe Institution of Engineers, like you rightly said, among other uh, uh, organizations. Are you saying they've been inept? They haven't been, they have been, sometimes they've been working too hard and then the other party was not listening. But now I think there is a meeting of minds. And sometimes they got tired, the other party wants to listen or government wants to listen. So what I urge ZIE and the built environment professionals is to engage government immediately. Come with this request. For instance, the Ghana, Zambia, in Zambia they have requested seriously for 40% of the work that is going to be done at Batoka. And my brief as the former president was that it's been considered favorably by their government. I don't see why ZIE, Engineering Council, Architect Council, the, 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 the Surveyors Council cannot do the same. Come up with a strong voice, positive. Look also, there are issues maybe at the cost of the projects and the quality. They should meet government and come up with an amicable win-win solution. Engineer Manua, I know that um, we have so much to talk about, but so little time. We hope we'll have you back in the studio to unpack the engineering sector. 
Thank, thank you, thank you, Tawanda, for giving me this opportunity to 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 speak to the view of viewers and, and, and fellow Zimbabweans. Thank Our you. guest was uh, Engineer Martin Manua. He is the chair, capacity building of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations (WFEO). He is also the president of the Federation of Africa Engineering Organizations and uh, currently acting chair of Zisco Steel. We've come to the end of the program. Join us again next time here on Economic Forum. On behalf of the crew behind the scenes, it's pleasant viewing.